Hello and welcome to the July 2020 Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Educational Research Journal Club podcast. The Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum is dedicated to the promotion, education, and dissemination of pre-hospital research. We believe that it is the responsibility of emergency medical professionals worldwide to build a body of evidence to examine pre-hospital emergency care. The PCRF partners with the National Association of EMS Educators to promote research literacy and advance the science of EMS educational research. Here with the PCRF Journal Club, we take a closer look at some of the latest research happening in medical education. I'm Megan Corey, and soon to be joining us will be David Page and Dr. Bill Toon. And uh, hopefully, if anybody out there would like to join live, you can, you're welcome to uh, message our organizer, and we'll gladly bring you in on this discussion. I'm sure there'll be a lot of opinions out there about uh, today's discussion. Uh, this is the study that we'll be reviewing um, that is Teacher Questions and Student Responses in Case-Based Learning, Outcomes of a Video Study in Medical Education. This is a German study published out of Munich, uh, published in the Open Access Journal BMC Medical Education in December of 2019. And we don't have an author uh, today, and my, maybe the time zone uh, is, a, is an issue or language, but that's okay. We can bring you in if you'd like to, or if you want to just um, throw a, a comment or a question into the chat, we can bring that in as we go. All right. So let's take a look at this study. The case-based learning um, is the, the focus of, of the study. So I think most of us in education understand that case-based learning is a highly effective way to teach and learn really in any subject. And it's certainly a critical aspect of teaching in medicine and the medical professions. Now in case-based learning, typically you have a teacher or clinician that presents the case and facilitates on an interactive student-centered session or discussion and uh, draws on background knowledge of the pathophysiology, assessment and history taking and differential diagnosis and treatment options. Now outcomes research is already out there, already exists for, for some time now and, and more recently in medical education that shows improved evidence of learning and student success metrics when the student is engaged as occurs in case-based learning in its purest form. And we'll talk about a little bit about that later on. Uh, what do we mean by case-based learning and how is it applied? And this study definitely brings some of that out. Uh, now, engagement, we know, is dependent upon interactivity between the teacher facilitator and the students. And as this um, group calls it, these researchers call it dialogic teaching, and we've probably heard that before, some type of dialogue between and interactivity between uh, the facilitator, the case itself, and the student. So the aim of this study um, was, and, and I think it's important to mention that this is not an outcome study. So if you're out there and as we're going through, you're wondering the big so what question of, you know, well, what is it, what effect does this have on student learning? What effect does this have on student outcomes and metrics and testing and all of the things that we're used to talking about? That's not the, the goal of this study. We already have some degree of knowledge about case-based learning and its effects and the effects of student outcomes when they're more engaged, the positive effects. So what they wanted to do was really tease apart the teacher question asking and the student response to those questions and how effective are they in eliciting uh, a basic biomedical knowledge from the student, making them apply that knowledge to a concrete case. So this was uh, really to examine the effectiveness of the different kinds of questions posed by the clinical teachers in this environment uh, and how the, te the students, the medical students responded. Now, this study takes what's called, and if you start to read the research and it makes your head swim to hear, read words like post-positivism and epistemological approaches, um, if you've ever looked at uh, qualitative research, um, post-positivism is the pursuit of objectivity. Uh, and that's by recognizing the possible effects of the researcher's bias. So it's commonly you'll see this language in mixed method studies so that consider both the quantitative and the qualitative aspects. And you see some of that in this study. And that epistemological just means a study of knowledge. So really after that, that purist perspective as a researcher to pursue what is it, you know, when we tease apart the details 
details of this interaction between teacher and student in a case-based uh, learning environment, uh, seeing what is the most effective interaction that will engage the student and thereby um, the assumption would be that the next translational step in educational research was improve their their performance, their outcome, their retention, all of those things that we think about in the long run. So, but they wanted to tease apart the details first. So they had 32 seminars, 16 in internal medicine and 16 in surgery. So they did do a little bit of inferential or, or uh, you know, quantitative you know, comparison methodology because they wanted to compare disciplines too, which is kind of a secondary part of this. Uh, but what they really wanted to do was, was evaluate the videotapes from the seminars. And after looking at the seminars um, and, the, the, and, and, and dividing them up into, um, you know, teachers who's teaching the seminar, they realized that they had some where the teacher taught several sessions. And what they did was they really only wanted to get one of the sessions um, from a teacher. So we have, um, they ended up with 19 individual teachers uh, videotape seminars. They only took the first session, so they got the very first session for everyone. So 19 videotape seminars, nine were in internal medicine, and 10 in surgery. These were taught by clinicians, the attendees were advanced medical students, and the length of the seminar was around an hour and 10 minutes, I think 83 minutes or something like that was the average, so somewhere around that. And it was billed as a case-based learning. I think that's important to remember for later. And what they did was they used multiple raters. This was a video-based study, so these were videotaped, and you'll see how they did that in a second. I'll, I'll forward the slide here. If you're looking at slides, you can see that this is the setup. They had cam two camera angles. Uh, they had a clinical teacher, and they had a little U-shaped section with students. Um, so everyone knew they were going to be videotaped. Um, there was IRB approval, which is an interesting thing that uh, you know we can talk about at some point too. But the, they had multiple raters that were going to watch these videos, and they focused on the three qualities of teachers' questions: whether or not they were open or closed, whether or not they were initial questions or follow-up questions and whether they were reproductive or elaborative. Uh, this is again, two medical disciplines, internal medicine and surgery. Now this, this type of what they call low inference rating, when you have raters that are watching videotapes and they're using what's called a low inference method, if you ever look at this up too, this is a skill. It's not a knowledge base to, to learn how to be someone who is a low inference rater. Um, and that means it, it comes with practice. So it's like, you might know how to do push-ups, but you might not be able to do 25 in 60 seconds. That takes practice. So low inference raters um, take practice. And essentially, this low inference technique means they, they look at these videos, they take notes based upon what is observable, not influenced by their perspective, uh, free of any kind of evaluative words and not drawing any conclusions. So there's a lot of quotes and there's a lot of objective notes. And they took this and created a coding scheme. Now, one of the things I wasn't clear on, and I think we now have uh, Dave and Bill and uh, and Katie uh, O'Connor who's joining us today, which I really appreciate. Love uh, Katie's got some terrific uh, educational experience recently, uh, so I'd love to bring her in on this. But uh, one of the things I wasn't clear on in this study is whether or not they created the coding scheme ahead of time and had the raters watch and code as they went. Did they create these these categories ahead of time, or did they do a pilot and evaluate, create the categories, and then have the uh, raters, or did the raters just pure, were they purists and watched the videotapes and and copied these things down and then created? Hey, Megan. Yeah, Megan. yes, there was a, a test thing that was done where they worked on it. It's described in the methods section. Okay, uh, I thought I remembered a pilot that they yeah, actually it was did a pilot outside. where they worked on this. They basically worked it all out and everything. So. Yeah, so so that's a that's another way of doing this, right? So rather than just creating it out of the air, you do a pilot and you create sort of categories, and and these are not new. I think people would read this and 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 not it wouldn't be too um, too new um, this, this language, open ended versus or open questions versus closed questions. But this table that I'm showing right now, table one is the categories that they create or, or that 
kind of bubbled up from their pilot then of teacher questions and student responses. So the first and foremost, you're going to have things that are didactically irrelevant. So things that are related to the seminar itself. Um, and the example they have here of an organizational question is, do you need my signature, you know, to confirm that you were here? And then the comprehension questions are just, you know, kind of a feedback question. Uh, you know, I somehow didn't hear you. Can you, you know, can you speak up or something like that? Those are didactically irrelevant, not related to the material. So they did count, you know, again, tally up how many of these were actually generated. And then the didactically relevant questions related to the learning goals of the seminar, you had the type, the openness, and the cognitive level. So the type would be whether it was an initial question or a follow-up question. Uh, and then the openness would be open or closed. I think we're uh, most AMS uh, educators are familiar with open questions versus closed. Now they define them a little bit differently than we we do, but pretty much the same. An open question, um, it's it's really not supposed to elicit a specific answer, but provides some type of you know um, freedom to elaborate and, and reflect and um, apply their knowledge. And then closed questions should have very few, not a single, but maybe few. So what are the H's and T's, you know, might produce kind of a, a question like that. Um, the uh, reproductive questions are very similar. So cognitive level is a reproductive question. Um, what does a, you know, a value tell you? Um, and then elaborative questions, you know, um, draw on your ability to interpret information and analyze and then uh, elaborate and explain. So you can hear Bloom's levels coming out in this too, Bloom's taxonomy coming out in this, um, the way that they've structured this. And then they looked at student responses or categorized student responses, again, organizational statements, um, and then they ask questions, were they reproductive or elaborative? Um, statements, meaning that they reproduced the knowledge or did they elaborate on it? They have some type of cause and effect uh, relationship. And then a non-response, which is really important. Um, and they looked at the responses, um, not necessarily, you know, individual students. So th this was how they categorized um, as they watched these videos. And then they, they were took this data and uh, presented it in a number of different ways, and we're going to look at that in a minute. But the frequencies and distributions were displayed um, in median range and interquartiles. Uh, box plots are uh, visualizations of the frequency of the different categories of questions. And then they did a little bit of hypothesis testing comparing the internal medicine versus surgery seminars. They had uh, several questions, though, and the, the questions, you'll notice there's one uh, in particular, I think, that, that we uh, want to focus on when we look at the relevance of this study, and that's the, the predictive value of a teacher question. Um, as, and the student, you know, whether will it generate a certain student answer? And for this, they use something called an evolutionary tree method, and we'll see that in a minute. So they had four basic questions. So one is which type of question do teachers, clinical teachers pose when they're doing a case-based learning project? Um, the second is how do the students respond then to the teacher questions? And the third is how does the type of question asked by the teacher clinical teacher predict the uh, nature of the response in case-based learning. And we're going to, again, make assumptions that certain types of responses are higher order, more critical thinking type of learning, and thereby may, you know, produce um, improved student metrics, uh, outcome metrics. And then are there differences between the internal medicine and surgery in terms of the type of questions asked and the student responses given? So uh, Katie and, and um, Bill, you guys are on here. Um, what did you think of when you first uh, read this study in terms of relevance to EMS before we kind of um, tease apart some of this, the, the tables here? I don't know, Katie, if you can hear me. Katie, yeah, I, can. <laughs> I yeah. can. Um, 
it, it's this is really interesting to us because we're trying to do this now. So our course was interrupted by COVID. So the way we normally would have run it is we're trying to come back just for skills. So we're using case-based scenarios to try to elicit all this knowledge and make sure they're ready for their exams. So it was super interesting. I was like, man, I need to learn what questions they asked and how to get the right responses. Because you, I'm sure everyone's experienced this when you ask a question and everyone looks at you like they have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. And you thought it was a question that would have worked, but you get blank stares. Yes. Uh, Dave, you also have something uh, here. I, I, yeah. Just in response to these research I, questions. I, I apologize. I was having a lot of audio trouble. I hope you can hear me okay. <clears throat> um, amazing. I, I think uh, I love what, how the authors say we were expecting that case-based learning would generate a lot of inference and deductive reasoning. <clears throat> and instead, uh, we found all of these closed questions that did not were not elaborated upon. And I think that's uh, that was a, a it struck me the whole, the whole thing struck me as wait a minute don't we want to use case based learning to elicit more of that clinical reasoning and elaboration but in fact the way we deploy it we may yes. en end up making it more about us telling them about a case instead of them telling us how would you think about this case yeah and <clears throat> in traditional problem based learning you 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 actually um, try you, the facilitator tries not to answer questions but replies with more questions sort of in a socratic well how would you look that up where would you look that up what do you consider about that you know so the um the insights here uh, as they as they point out are i think uh, quite profound for us that those of us who are thinking oh well we'll just use a case and just because we use the case that would be that would be yeah you know, induce the clinical reasoning. I also thought yeah. it was interesting that, you know, they compared internal medicine to surgery, and you'd think that the um, uh, the internal medicines are sort of more, uh, medicine docs are, are more of a whodunit, you know, they I think they, they do more of a detective work, and in my opinion, versus a surgeon who's going in to, you know, cut something out or, or but the surgeons, it looks like had um, quite a bit more uh, more elaboration. So um, maybe maybe that isn't exactly completely. Uh, that's a stereotype I have. Yeah, yeah, I know. I thought that too. Um, th so we're we're actually talking a little bit about the results, and and let's dive into some of these um, tables. But I think you're hitting on all of the the main points here is just because we say we're doing case-based learning doesn't mean we're optimizing the way that we teach uh, case-based learning for the student outcome. So here we have um, the, the first thing, the table we're seeing is the frequency of teacher questions. So this is just purely frequency, teacher questions and student answers per seminar per minute. And actually, before we go into this, I do want to mention that thing that I mentioned before, which is the IRB. Um, if, because I think this is a very doable thing for researchers, educators out there to become research. I, I think videotape is a powerful tool that, especially because you save it and you have it and you can use it, whether it's simulations or or teacher videotaping uh, teachers teaching, um, it's a powerful research tool to go back and look at. But the IRB piece of this was um, was interesting. They, they actually had, so they had approval by the Ethics Committee, which a lot of uh, people don't realize. You do have to do this. It doesn't have to be a placebo-controlled clinical trial to need ethics approval. And that teachers and students were informed prior to the start. Um, they I think they were emailed. They did have one physician that refused to take part, so they didn't record that one, so they had an opt-out. And they did have a student that didn't want to be videotaped. Um, and so they asked the student to maybe sit beside the camera, um, and you can see in that one uh, earlier uh, figure that there's a, the cameras were situated in a way where you could be out of view of the camera. And then after they analyzed that, they, they realized they didn't want to use that the responses. So now, you know, you might ask as a researcher, one of your concerns might be, well, videotape alone and then knowledge of the study 
uh, and a signature on a consent form, which means they knew what you were studying, um, do, do these change their behavior and alter the results? So that's always going to be a question as a researcher is how will this change your behavior? So um, what, what I would love to know too is if if you're getting a truly informed consent, then they know everything about your study, which means you would think there would be even more elaborative, <laughs> you know, the opposite effect of what we're seeing in this study, which we didn't. So I, I think um, the concern over whether uh, someone's watching uh, may be less than, than I was thinking at first when I was reading this study. So, um, but the more we videotape, the less people care uh, that the videotape is going, and, and I think, and and so the more maybe we'll be able to get like real um, responses. And I, I think maybe with the uh, pervasiveness of video when YouTube and everything else, people are getting a little, uh, you know, used to being videotaped. It may also be the audience. I think mm. when you have um, <clears throat> when you have people who are used to being videotaped because a surgery is being videotaped or because um, you've you've been used to uh, doing um, uh, patient interviews where the uh, programmed patient is is uh, interacting with you, then maybe you get used to it. But for any researchers out there, because I think, like you said, this is very doable for EMS to do this in mm -hmm. the classroom. Um, it's sort of watching the, the teacher, but I think uh, learning from how we induce uh, critical thinking and how we can improve it is, I think, a critical part of how we improve as teachers. I would guess the more you know these pilots and the and the kind of mounting of the camera to be part of a permanent fixture so that nobody thinks about it is, I think, useful to sort of have it be. Uh, reduce the Hawthorne effect, so to speak, that that effect of people be feeling like they're they're being watched. Yeah, and and the more we do this, that the again the the more accustomed people come uh, become to to having a, a camera in the corner of the room or in the. Um, but we still have to inform people of research, just so uh, you're out there and you're thinking, well, I'd like to do this, but I really don't want to have to talk to people about the research. I'd rather just do it in sort of a clandestine way. Um, that's actually not uh, not something you can really do without an IRB approval. So The work okay. that we're looking for is ethical. Ethical, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and there's all kinds of we can we can have an entire session on the ethics of biomedical research. Um, it's probably not a bad idea in terms of uh, going through scenarios of different types of research and which things need ethical review and why. So table two here um, shows again the frequency of teacher questions and student responses per seminar per minute. So you see all kinds of ways this uh, data are teased out. You have the median, you have the min max, and you have the interquartile range, and you'll see a visualization in the next um, slide here. But this is um, surgical teachers. This is where you can see that surgical teachers uh, maybe ask a little more, a few more questions than uh, internal medicine uh, teachers. Um, in the in, in the seminars uh, that was just sort of a basic one and then the student responses so you can see just basic numbers here and then in the next slide uh this this figure here the box plots the what this is a the research question one this addresses the very first research question of what types of questions do clinical teachers pose in case-based learning so you can see the very, relatively few of the non-didactic uh, questions up here in the top. Um, so the comprehension organizational, these are non-didactic questions. Um, and then the didactic questions, the follow-up and, and initial, you can see really a, a very big kind of difference here. And the initial question, you know, again, doesn't really draw on, on having you think critically through something or analyze something. The follow-up question tends to be more elaborative. So that's in this, uh, you can see the big difference here and you have no interlap, uh, you know, no overlap at all. You got a few outliers in each, which always makes me wonder, you know, what's that? But uh, you have uh, the uh, nice gap between the initial and follow-up. So you could, that one is, is really clearly a difference. And then the teacher questions, uh, the types, you see open versus closed uh, questions. You can see more, 
uh, closed questions than open questions, even though there's a little gap, um, overlap in the range, the interquartile range and the medians are, are pretty distinctly different. And, and again, this is in terms of the percentage of the types of questions that are asked in these seminars. And then in the, finally, you see um, reproduction versus reasoning uh, types of questions. Um, and you can see that the overlap a little bit in the range, but more reasoning uh, questions in terms of the cognitive level than reproduction. This is again, just, just the relative frequencies um, and the percentages per seminar. So that's in each individual seminar. Uh, now we're getting into um, this next table shows the crossover, um, I'm sorry, the, um, the combinations of questions. So uh, in the previous slide, you saw that there were uh, more closed than open uh, questions, 70% uh, versus 28%, more reasoning than reproductive, 67% versus 31%. And incidentally, the only difference we saw between internal medicine and surgery in terms of the uh, question types per seminar were more reasoning questions, uh, like David said earlier, in the internal medicine than in the surgical. Um, that had a p-value of 0.05, but otherwise we don't see any difference after this, uh, after this point. And that was just, again, in relative frequency. This is the frequency of question types when you start combining uh, the type, the openness, and the cognitive level. And this is, I think, probably my, my favorite table because you can see uh, really uh, pretty clearly that there's a combination that is more common um, in both internal medicine and surgery, no difference really when you start putting it on the box plot. Um, and the combinations of initial uh, with closed and reasoning um, or initial closed and reproduction and then finally initial open and reasoning type of questions um, were the, they dominated these, um, these uh, case-based seminars or case-based learning seminars with no significant difference um, between the disciplines. So these are, you know, we're still on the questions. So this is just about what type of questions the teachers ask. What about the student responses? And that's what we're really after, right? So the next one um, now addresses research question um, two, and actually uh, and table two kind of did too. Let me see if I've got that. That's actually um, before. So the, the research question two is how the students respond. And so we have um, multiple, so we, this is the one that's concerning to me, the top one, and actually I'm moving my mouse, but you can't see it on your screen, so sorry about that, the top one. Non-response, so the relative frequencies of different types of student responses and non-response. Non-response is the dominant response, a very high degree of non-response with a, uh, a median of 54%. Um, so an, an equal number of elaborative and reproductive responses generally with a few outliers. So I, I think I'm, I'm really glad they included um, non-response, not just the types of, of responses if the student did respond because a non-response to me indicates a lack of engagement um, or could indicate a lack of engagement. Uh, what did you think of this, Dave? I <clears throat> I think it's very interesting because pretty much non-response and reproductive statements seem to me like completely useless. It's just yes. repeating. Either you're repeating something or you're not you're not responding at all. So if you add those two together, you know, 75% or so is just not. There's nothing happening. At least nothing you can see, and and that. It seems to me like why bother? Um, yeah. The elaborative statements seem like that's 20%. And uh -huh. I thought, you know, from all the research we've seen before, and we've, we've certainly done some podcasts about it, you, you would tend to think that discussion would spur those higher bloom order kind of, uh, of engagement would be much greater. But it it didn't it didn't seem to work with this group. And I do want to caution everybody: this is just one group, and it's it's also you know the context in which this is done is really important because different groups may uh, be used to this kind of learning and may engage more, and different teachers may have different you know levels of comfort engaging on particular topics. So I don't 
I don't think this uh, is an indictment on case-based learning, but it certainly mm -hmm. says it all is, it's all about the teacher. Uh, so, I think it's an know. indictment on the way we, t you know, on right. how it's thought, right? Yeah. So I think, um, and Katie, you can weigh in here. You're, you have boots on the ground with, with a lot of changes uh, going on in the transition to online learning. You know, one of the things we talk about quite a bit is how to make sure that that non-response doesn't exist. And some of this is simply calling on individuals, right? So, you know, how does the teacher ensure that there's not a non-response? And can you do that, you know, in in a, a Zoom breakout room or in, you know, whatever? Um, are you more likely to engage students in, you know, it, I guess it's all about really student engagement. So, and I think, uh, you know, Katie has shown that in some of her presentations recently with with what are some of the methods that we can use to engage students and, and we can then infer that that will Im improve their their outcomes. So I thought it was really interesting that they were saying that some of the questions the instructors posed only they only gave a couple seconds for students to respond yes. and then they started to repose a question. And I think especially when we move to online learning, there is that delay. I almost wonder if it'll force instructors to give students the amount of time they need to formulate a response before we ask another question or reword our question. Um, I'm cognizant that I talk pretty fast, and so I probably am one of the problems in case-based learning where this response doesn't come fast enough, so I'm already saying something else and don't even give them a chance. Yes, what about asking a group of students, you know, say you have five students with you and you ask a group rather than pointing to individuals and what do we get? The same one or two that answer and if you leave enough time, they won't, even if they're, they're say, thinking, feeling, you know, even if you're a student that feels like you answer quite a bit and you want to be quiet for this next question, if you leave enough time, they're going to have, to, it's like they can't help themselves, they're going to jump in and answer and that leaves the other students you know, without that engagement and, and then us without the ability to assess them as well and assess their knowledge. So, yeah, I, I think this was really more of a, like you said, a, a, maybe not an indictment or an evaluation, whatever we want to say, of the actual teacher's um, effort to engage the student as well and, and to maybe individualize the learning. Uh, I don't know how, I, I don't remember how large these seminars were. I don't remember if they told us the average number of students that were in, was this a lecture hall type? Did they, no, actually it wasn't. We saw the little setup. So it looked like it was, you know, about 12 yeah, students around group. the table. That's right, it was small groups. So that's even, this is even more kind of mind blowing when you have small groups um, and, and you have the opportunity to walk around and say, okay, you two discuss this, you two discuss this, then come back and, and individually, you know, target them and, and engage. Um, yeah, that, that came later the in the setup, discussion. Though, I do think that they have it, I mean, they set it up so that the teacher is still front and center in sort of yes. that U shape, you know, there's a show going on. It's not like, um, you know, in, in most of the problem-based learning stuff I've done or read, you put everybody facing each other. There's a conversation that's going to happen between the students. And if you're one of the people around a, a round table, then you're one of the nodes. You're not, you're not expected to be, <clears throat> there's not a, a presentation, so to speak. So I think this is an interesting, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of disappointed. One of the limitations they list is that they didn't find similar research with problem-based learning. In other words, there's there's plenty of medical schools using a full problem-based learning curriculum who you would think would have done a little bit of work around this, maybe, uh -huh. but they weren't able to find it. And so <clears throat> one is left with you know a bit of the social engineering uh, question about, is it just that you know, we switched the tables around, we called it something else, but it's really the same thing. It's a lecture and you're sort of interacting based on a on, on a, a patient presentation or a case. So I really appreciate Katie's words because if we just keep talking, the student never actually, you know, engages. And I think that's, you know, a lot of what we've been doing around Flip Classroom has been trying to give them worksheets where it's less of a presentation and more of a here's what here's the case we have and if they're 
presenting the case to each other and trying to solve the, the problems, then the guide on the side, the, you know, there's less tendency for us to begin to pontificate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dave, right. they said in this study, they had seven seminars that mm -hmm. when you really looked at it, they were lectures. And yes. so, I mean, it's supposed to be the same thing, but the variability between 200 questions asked and like, what was it, less than 100 questions asked, that is really striking to me. I think I think that you know even debriefings during simulations are lectures. People just you know if you really start to and I would encourage any EMS instructor to do this, especially with adjuncts, um, to just record it and set a timer and clock the amount of time that the instructor is talking. Um, because when we when we did this and we observed the amount of time that our instructors were actually talking instead of the students doing hands-on it is striking the amount of time the student is just sitting there listening in a skill station yes forget a, uh, forget a, uh, an event like a simulation or a case you know, they're just sitting there listening to you and everybody gets to touch the mannequin once if anything it's the meeting around the mannequin is what i call it the table discussion but, oh but nothing real substantive when it comes to clinical reasoning or skill acquisition. So Hello. they brought the chairs back in the classroom here. Hello. I had hidden them from them. <laughs> Hello. Are, you Bill? Really, are you really surprised by this? This is all I've seen of EMS education for the last 45 years. Okay, so what are we gonna do about it, Bill? Well, we see well, clearly to Bill's going to retire. That's that's his his strategy. No, I'm, okay. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get Bill to. We're, we're gonna we're gonna have something at we, one point where Bill's saying, "Wait, we've finally done it. We've made it so they're but, not I mean, as as this author says, it, medical teachers simply out talked their student." I had to laugh out loud when I read that. <laughs> How do we, we change this? But we but we have to. It it, it takes more time. Yeah. And time seems to be the 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 devil. Uh, that we have is, the, and and I think that, and I, I can't speak for the instructors that are listening, the people that are in the classroom all the time, but I've always found that it, it, there is such a time pressure that you have this amount of time to get this covered in, and you and and instead of saying, well, we didn't get that, we didn't get it done, we're going to follow it up in the next class session. We're on such tight schedules, or our class sizes are so large, and we don't have enough help to break out, and I mean. We yeah. don't set ourselves up for success, which means we don't set our students up for success. I, I'm just not surprised by this at all. And um, there's many people that go through life as wallflowers. Yeah. Well, the, the, I think you're right in, in that sense that we do, we're rescuers. And when the administration says you got to do it with less, we say, no problem, we can do that. Um, we might complain about it a little bit, you know, here and there, but we're, we'll handle it. It's an MCI. And that's probably not the best way for our um, for our students to learn, and it, and it just keeps reproducing itself, right? Because people and teach so when, so, on what they've had. So when you look at a provider, I I was looking at when they were looking at the uh, the range of the edu the educators in here. You know, uh, I think the average they said was seven years or something like that, but they had a range in there mm -hmm. of the the clinical educators they're not going to be able to bring something new into this because they themselves still have all of their own ingrained old habits into them. And, and I think if we want to change ourselves, we have to be willing to do the work um, with ourselves, you know, and really have, you know, your performance based upon when you're in class, are you talking all the time? Okay, well, that's part of your performance. I mean, we have to carry yeah. and stick. I'm not sure what the answer is, but we have to change our behavior before we can expect something to happen in the classroom. And then the other problem that comes along is many students, I love these evaluations that I get that say, I came here to learn something and the person told me I had to go back and look it up. Why did I even come? You yeah. know, and, and because I'm not unusual where I'll say, well, you know, this is a great opportunity for you to go read this in detail. And people get upset when you tell them to go do something like that. That's I don't want anyone to, to necessarily believe everything that comes out of my mouth. Well, student yeah. evaluations too, though, students can feel entertained as well. Well, I found that, you know, the instructor is very entertaining. But a year from now, when you ask them what did they learn, 
you know, th th did it actually, you know, translate? Sorry, Dave, go ahead. Well, I and I'm I'm looking at some very smart educators that are actually in the in the participant attendee list who I think have great answers to this. I mean, I, I know for sure Ann Bellows uh, would be the first one. And if if you indicate that, we will unmute you and and I'm sorry to out you as as an audience member, but she's been working on AMLS and uh, for a long time. And I think AMLS do, did use this case based uh -huh. structure to elicit an interactivity. And that is, you know, call it a, a bit of a structure. Or it, it, it's a cookie cutter method to get a, a wider group of instructors to follow a, a case-based learning process and institutionalize it as a, you know, certification course by an AMT. So, it could, you know, can that be more generally applied? And I see Kim McKenna on here, sorry to out you as well. Um, but when you look at all of that, um, the work around the simulation and how we, <clears throat> you know, the, the super study that, that Kim was involved with where the mannequins were still in the closet, um, you, you sort of put these things together as we need a, a process by which educators can get uh, taught how to do this correctly. And I do I do think the AMLS structure does begin to do that. It gives you a roadmap, if you've never done this before, to say, okay, stop, ask the question. Uh, but it still requires some fairly good facilitation skills. Otherwise, what you're doing is just like what we saw in this study, you might ask the question and like Katie said, never, you never wait for the answer or you, you know, write it up on the board and you, aren't quite eliciting that critical thought because you've just, you know, replied. Well, and Dave, I think too, the other thing that they saw, said in the study was the type of ordering of the questions made a difference. Uh -huh. So the way that you, which question you ask first, um, I think for sure I could see myself falling into the the poll that some of this the, these instructors did where you ask this big open-ended question to try to get it going and the students weren't able to do that you needed to start with the small kind of um what do they I forget the fancy term reproduction question yeah. uh first so almost scripting these cases for our instructors so they have an idea of what questions to ask in what order could really be helpful, especially because we don't do training for our lab instructors. It's just you were a good paramedic on the street, you're a good preceptor, hey, come into the lab and let's just get rolling in skills. Uh, it would be helpful to have a script. I think I would have a lot better uh, success if I had a script. I couldn't agree with you more. I think going into some of these scenarios, people have chips on their shoulders and they have cases they want to share and they're like, oh, this case is good to bring out one of my pet peeves. And then suddenly the the razor sharp point that the the scenario or the or the case or the problem based learning event was supposed to come uh, come out and 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 test or or reach is completely obfuscated by a war story or a <clears throat> or a pet peeve and you don't really understand. So what's the point of this? Um, that's another aspect I think that I really like about some of the scenarios that Anne and others worked on for AMLS. We, we've got we've got to kind of bring out the this is what we need to get to, and you need to ask this question. And then I think we need more of the so then follow up with it. Like how do you this elaborative piece that's in this study? I think is is key in order to be able to have open-ended questions that then draw out critical thought and ask the ask the uh, participants, uh, do you agree with this? Would you do something differently? And 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 sometimes two answers are correct, which drives our our audience crazy because they're very black and white. Tell me what to do, and sometimes you can do it in a couple of different ways. Yeah. Ooh, so this is that, the that landed in yeah. silence. So it yeah. must. It, no, I didn't so get a response questions. from Bill. <laughs> no, you were you were very. I don't disagree with you. You were very profound. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, it, so many questions too. Like Katie brings up a really good point: is the sequence of questioning. Um, you know, like you said, a script, having a script or 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 a sequence of questioning more effective too in in getting uh, the depth. Again, these are only eighty three minute small uh, seminars. Um, you know, with twelve students in them it looked like from that if that uh, 
diagram is accurate. So this figure five uh, is the final one, this evolutionary tree. I had to look at this for a long time, but, but read through what they were um, discussing about um, this figure. Essentially, you've got your uh, node one up at the top here, the cognitive level of the teacher question making a difference. Just like you were saying, um, Dave, we're, we're looking for the highest degree of elaborative student answer. And node six is associated with follow-up reasoning questions. So we have the, the lowest degree also of non-response. That's the one we're talking about is the, not just the highest degree of elaborative response, but the lowest degree of non-response. I mean, just looking across the four you know, nodes three, four, six, and seven, which are all the student responses, and then everything at the top of that, uh, the, the evolutionary tree as the teacher re, uh, questioning. Just looking across those, just looking at the high degree of non-response here is, is, um, is important. But then where there's a high degree of non-response is also important. And then look at the, the number of uh, closed reproductive questions, um, 505, and then, then open, uh, 35. And then on the other side, you see, uh, you know, 945 um, student responses here in, in uh, the reasoning and initial questions. So just the, the numbers, too, I think are, are really important here. But the numbers of non-responses across the board, um, I, in a case-based seminar with a small group of students, is uh, that that was... That blew my mind, uh, truthfully. But th they did conclude several times. They say in their in their future research sec uh, section that um, you know they weren't very interactive. They were more like lectures, anchored in example cases, occasional episodes of interaction, and that this wasn't really the concept of case-based learning in its purest form. So that it might be interpreted and practiced in different ways. So we'll get at that interpretation and practice. Um, where does this fit into? what Bill talks about a lot, which is the preparation of our educators. So, you know, how much can be open to interpretation and how much needs to be anchored in research here? Oh, I'm curious how, what Bill's gonna answer here, I think uh, critical. I like Stephen's, uh, Stephen Clayton's comment too. Scripting is valuable and requires additional prep time. And, and who has that additional prep time is the is the great question. So either we work together or it's going to be reinvent the wheel, every one of us. Um, and and uh, he, he goes on to say we goes on to say we we also have to be ref, uh, flexible in questioning depending on student knowledge base uh, and willingness to to participate. Um, and you know I think that's so true as well. I don't know, Bill. Well, Dave, you touched on something there that I, I do think that's important and, and Megan, first of all, do we really prepare our educators to be educators? And we have so many different names for people who work with students. Often, you know, if you think the, the greatest amount of interaction is supposed to take place, or I would think would take place, where you're doing some kind of skill lab work, six or less students with uh, a part-timer and adjunct faculty and stuff. How much time have you had really to develop that uh, person? And how often is it sometimes uh, people scrambling at the last minute for someone just to come in and sit to be with that group, whether they're really ready to take on that task at all or not? And I think that it gets back to it is, do we do, EM, and, and I'm gonna use a term, and, and please don't get offended anyone, I'm gonna say, do we do EMS education on the cheap? Uh -huh. Meaning, look at typically the FTEs assigned to a nursing program compared to the FTEs assigned to the typical EMS oh, program. Oh, don't get me wow. started. <laughs> oh, say, oh, 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 this, this like, is likely to get me into trouble. <laughs> well, but, but it is. It, but it, it's it, true. You're right. 100%. I will tell you, though, that's driven a lot by regulation and by accreditation as well. So um, I'm throwing that out there. But, uh, you know, so what we need I, is more regulation and accreditation for <laughs> EMS programs so that we can require all of these folks to actually have enough instructors and and therefore not have them so busy they can't actually learn to be instructors because they just have to jump into the fire and just teach because they're the only ones. And, and you know, that's why I really love it, uh, you know, when when I had the, when I was working in Virginia and I had the staff of people, I would send them, whether it was NEMSI one or NEMSI two, boy, they would come back charged up and 
feeling great about the experience. And then they would, within a week, they fell back into their trap of having to get things done. And, you know, and I always try to encourage them. I says, well, is this an opportunity for you to use a, a new skill that you talked about or a new opportunity? And then regardless of trying to create, I was fortunate enough to be able to try to create the environment for them, but still it's up to them to manage and get the class done within the time frame. I just, I just think it's unrealistic expectations we have of of what we're expected to do with something that is so critical. And uh, I I do think we we cheapen our education process from what it could be in developing really the competent, long term competent, you know, self educated you know people who really want to expand and grow in this field. And and we have a tendency to value experience, right? So when we do hire and someone comes with their CV and they have lots of education experience, sometimes I've found what that means is they've been a guest lecturer, which means they've been the sage on the stage many times um, without having to do all the prep work and the background and the outcomes measures and all of those things, or they've been a skills instructor, which means they've popped in and done some skills instruction, uh, again, without much training or a thought to how to do a, be a skills instructor, but they have a lot of experience as an educator. So they, you know, that because they've actually done this. So that's another thing I think is is the issue. So it's that teacher prep, uh, but and, also, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, and, and I'm saying if we look at the, and I'm not saying it's a perfect system, but if you look at how they develop people to become K through 12 teachers mm -hmm. and that there is, you know, that they have to go out and there is an internship in yes. a class and they have to do these different things and turn these different assignments. And, you know, they have the time to develop some of those things in the real world environment. And is it an ideal? Is it, no, but it's better. I think it's far better than what we do in EMS. And you're, you're not going to convince me uh, that me taking an ACLS instructor course or a CPR <laughs> instructor course or a, when it, the ABC course, whatever, their instructor thing, you know, is going to make someone a competent um, educator. And I it's like I love the NEMSI courses, but they're primers. You know, they are still in so many ways are survey courses and not allowing the, the full in-depth development of someone that needs to happen as an educator. And it, I think, again, we, we it, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I, you know, that's almost the kind of argument we have here is, is that. Well, even what we do when, when we promote our educators going to their master's programs and doctorate programs and studying education, they're isolated, they produce a product, they publish it somewhere, it goes into a dissertation ProQuest, you know, file somewhere, and that's it. We don't even collaborate there. And I think that's uh, another piece of it is just, just getting the degrees doesn't do it either. We have to, it's got to be a, a community of practice, which I think... You know, Katie, you've got a lot of experience with communities of practice recently, and I think this this COVID is an opportunity. Uh, what's been happening here, developing this community of practice of everyone turning to one another and saying, what are you doing and how are we doing this and is it effective? Uh, it's a huge opportunity to, to keep that and grab with it, you know, grab onto that concept and run with it, even when we do return. Yeah, I think it's been great. I mean, like we got, you know, uh, Bill into our class to really help facilitate some of these online scenarios. And, you know, because he knows how to debrief and because he can lead these instructions, we actually ended up with significantly higher problem solving and, and critical thinking level um, discussions and conversations for the students. And then we saw an increase in their tests. So we actually did see increase in their scores and the class averages went up and they did better on problem solving questions. Um, but one of the things that the study mentions is the need for students to feel psychologically safe, to be able to yes. answer questions because they're afraid of getting it wrong. And yes. that's something that I think is really difficult that we don't teach at all to EMS instructors on how to, to foster psychological safety in the classroom. and. For sure, in the fire service and in EMS, that's not something that we do well. I mean, we still have problems with hazing and making fun of people, and um, we don't have great conversations on um, race and equity and all of those things. So that's an area where, man, I feel like I need education on before I can even do yeah. it. Right? Yeah, so hard. really hard. How I, are you going to tell a space like that to an instructor who comes agree. in once I a month? Agree more. I couldn't agree more. There, there is so much subtlety there 
to you know how to do this job which is actually what makes it fun and exciting and challenging but it's also a, a nightmare to think i'm you know i grew up in a more of a tough love kind of environment so i'm much more prone to saying i don't care you know answer the question like i'm going to call on the person that's the quietest and <clears throat> that can that can be taken as very intimidating behavior and students do, you know, give me that feedback sometimes, like, "Oh, Dave, you're, you know, you, you intimidate me." And then later on, uh, when they're actually working with me as a partner out on the ambulance, I feel like we, we rebond, and they go, "Yeah, I was really afraid you were going to call on me," um, and and I don't know, I've I've I inappropriately, I think, shrugged it off and thought, "Look, forget it." I, you know, I, I like Tammy Wilk's uh, comment here about. It's not just the educators, but the students need to uh, learn how this environment can work and how to ask the right questions and how to engage. And I think that could help. But I, I also agree with Bill in terms of, well, we make paramedic students go ride along. Why wouldn't we make educators go participate in a class and have an internship? Yep. Because... Uh, that that would let them see how a, an experienced educator would handle some of this. Now, are they just going to learn bad habits because you know uh, even us old dogs are, have bad habits? So, I I think it's very tough, Katie. I I can't agree with you more. And especially when it comes to equity, uh, you know, even minor details. I, I thought it was really helpful recently. I I heard somebody referring to female students by their first name and then the male students by their last name or vice versa, you start to pick up on these little subtle ways in which educators have treated people in their class very differently based on their belief of whether they can do the job or not, or whether they're, you know, they're culturally, forget skin color for a minute, just culturally, prone to do one thing or another. If we have groups of firefighters and they sit together and they're part of a, a, of a fire department where they're really a strong team, they form a culture and that sometimes can either facilitate or hinder a culture inside the classroom that says, you're all a class, you're not just the people who are employed or the people who are not employed. And the, the work that it takes to get to these um, get peel the onion, you know, get the layers out so that each learner is participating. Uh, very, very challenging, I think. Yeah. You know, I think we've had a lot of activity around the NEMC instructor um, courses lately, too, so that um, because there's the level one and level two, now there's the psychomotor skills um, instructor uh, course, um, and we have some position papers coming out uh, again on um, you know, cultural humility in EMS, and these are sort of pieces I think that that again a foundation or something that we can build around a community of practice to build around, and then also this idea of having internships. I think internships, even if they're in a setting where you see practices that maybe aren't something ideal, it just thinking about them, just drawing out the ability to, to think about and reflect on your own biases as you're teaching and uh, just asking people to do that, I think, is, is important. They've also mentioned, related to what Katie was saying, too, uh, and I think actually Stephen Clayton was saying something similar. He really um, felt that we need more agreeing with uh, what Bill had said earlier about an internship, um, it, but felt that there was a lot of good foundation uh, in the, his uh, instructor course but found that you know these these skills wane over time, uh, but that they provided a good foundation. They just needed to be you know uh, reinforced. But there was that that whole concept of error management behavior that they mentioned in here too. And we talked about this before about failure, making it making the student feel safe, not only safe but valuing failure as a way to learn. So I mean, all of these things I think are so important in an instructor, um, and especially in case based learning. Any other, uh, we're closing in on the top of the hour and we always have the best, you know, momentum <laughs> right before we end here. Well, um, I, I, Megan, I, I just want to really congratulate you and, and Bill. Uh, digging up these uh, uh, studies is not easy. And I know, you know, we have a monthly podcast and 
uh, it's it's um, uh, the stuff that's relevant. And right now, especially during this pandemic, you know, do you do you address it? Do you not? Are people just sick and tired of hearing about it? But we keep teaching, and we keep needing to find new ways to teach. And I just want to congratulate you. I think that um, that you know the depth of the analysis uh, that you do, and and your amazing radio personality voice, um, is is phenomenal. And and thank you to Kim McKenna because I know she's listening, yes. um, yeah. taking care of her her grandson. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, and um, and Kim puts it into words for uh, for uh, publication for Nemzi and and others. So. Thank you so much for that and and all of the effort made. And again, congratulations. Yes, and thank you and to Bill for joining us and especially Katie O'Connor, who has been really instrumental in bringing out uh, the community of practice uh, that we've formed. Let's continue with this community of practice as educators. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We will be back with another PCRF Education Research Podcast Friday, August 8th. 28th, 2020 at 10 a.m. Pacific, noon central. And don't forget, there is a clinical podcast that happens um, Monday, August 10th. And again, that's 10 a.m. Pacific, noon central. If you would like to present an uh, upcoming article or you'd like to suggest one even, just send an email to David Page at dpage at emsed.net. Thank you all and see you next time.